It was, I mean, it was, it was epic. It was pretty crazy. It was like, at one point, it was like a scene out of Narnia. It's like, for Aslan and for and the two armies are going right at each other, and then there's like credible explosion of paint, and I was far from it. <laughs> I was at a safe distance. It was pretty awesome. Uh, thanks for, you know, joining with us as we have such a passion for reaching the next generation. There was a lot of volunteers. They came out cooking hamburgers and hot dogs, cleaning up, setting things up. All for actually for a couple of days leading up to that. So just so grateful for a church that is committed to reaching the next generation. Thank you. And uh, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. They had a lot of great pictures and videos that they made. And this was just to give you a quick snapshot of what it was like. We'll, you'll see more uh, in, in a couple of weeks. I wanted today, uh, before I get into the message, to pray for some people. Uh, this is Pentecost Sunday. And as I read at the beginning of the service in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to reach the world, is to empower us to fulfill the Great Commission. And so today, uh, we have some groups going out, and I want to ask them to come on up. We've got uh, a group that's getting ready to go to Texas on a short trip. Would you guys come and join me? And also the Conleys, who are getting ready to head out. They are with GoTo Nations, missionaries with GoTo Nations, and they're getting ready to head out. And we want to just pray for them this morning as they go. Uh, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. That means you reach right here in your own neighborhood, and then to the communities around you, to the, to the world around you. And so we had a group come back a few weeks ago from Tunisia. We've got another one going out next month to Uganda. And so we're committed to doing our part to helping fulfill the Great Commission. And Collins, why don't you guys come on over here real quick. And um, this is our group that's heading out to Texas. They're going to be working with Shiloh Ministries in Liberty, Texas. And it's a ministry really that helps people that have dealt with drug and alcohol addiction, uh, processing through that and getting into what God is doing in their lives. And so they're going to be going out and serving with Shiloh Ministries there. And then you guys are going out uh, with Go To Nations. And Chris, tell everybody just where you're going real quick and how long you guys will be there. We are actually headed to uh, Larnaca, Cyprus. Um, and as we also will be in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, we leave on Tuesday the 7th and return on August the uh, 16th. <laughs> so, um, and the purpose of it is is it's a ten and a half week internship. Sheila and I have been missionaries with GoTo Nations for ten years, and we never participated in the internship. And we thought, better late than never, and here we are. <laughs> Sounds like some of you in growth track. <laughs> Just saying, Mark. Anything about Shiloh you want to say before I pray for you guys? Well, we're working with some friends that uh, Pat has had and I've had for many years, like twenty five years or so. We're excited to go. We'll be serving these men, uh, setting up prayer appointments, praying for them individually, and just serving in any way we can. Awesome. So what we want to do is just pray for them. And, uh, you know, Chris and Sheila, like you said, they've been missionaries for a long time with GoTo Nations. We help to support them and sponsor them. I'm very proud that you guys are doing this. And even though you're not here, we won't forget about you. We'll keep praying for you. We're so grateful that you're going out where we can't go. And so would you guys just join me, and let's just pray for, for these as they get ready to head out as an extension of of our community and of our church family into these very important ministries that they'll be partnering with. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and we lift up these laborers. You said to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers out into the harvest field. And I thank you, God, for these men and women that are willing to listen to your call to go be your laborers out into the harvest field. We pray that as they go, God, that you would protect them. You would protect them physically, spiritually, in every way, God. We pray that you'd protect their things, their belongings, their travel. In Jesus' name, Lord, no weapon formed against them would prosper. And God, we also pray that you would give them favor, favor in your eyes, favor in the eyes of men, that you would bless them along the way, that you would use them. God, I thank you that what you're going to do through them, you're also going to do to them. I pray that their hearts would be open to receive from all you all that you want to do in their lives and we thank you god that as they go they will be fruitful and effective in their ministry we bless them in jesus name amen amen let's give them a hand thank you guys so much chris and sheila uh will be out at the missions corner after along with mark baxter if you have more questions about their ministry and what they're doing you can go find out more about that how you can partner with them and at the very least continue to pray for them as they go okay today it's pentecost sunday now, people sometimes ask me, what kind of church are you guys? Why are you laughing? <laughs> because maybe they ask you that too. So here, here's, a, here's a fun answer. We're Episcopal Baptist Methodical. 
We're, it, some people go, yeah, me too, right? Because we've all sort of been on this journey. We're a convergence church. Throughout church history, there are three historic streams of the church. They're always there. They may change different names. They may have different denomination you know, identifiers. But these three streams are present throughout church history. You have your, you have your, your sacramental liturgical stream. And there in the sacramental liturgical stream, you really focus on the mystery and the majesty of God, God the Father, our Father who art in heaven. You walk into a cathedral and instantly you feel like you're supposed to be in a place and an attitude of reverence as you think about the holiness and awesomeness of God the Father. And then you get into the evangelical stream and the focus is on a personal relationship with God by putting faith in Jesus Christ and line upon line teaching from scripture, building your life on God's word. That's the evangelical stream. And then the Pentecostal charismatic stream really focuses on pneumatology, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the gift of the Holy Spirit in our life. Right? Those three streams are always there. Our church is a part of a group that is convergent, that's bringing these three streams together. That says we believe all three are valid. We don't have to exclude one and for, for another. And it's really a very Trinitarian approach to God. There are three basic creeds. There's a lot of important creeds. But there are three basic creeds that are accepted by the church. That are accepted by the sacramental church, by the evangelical church, by the Pentecostal church. The reformed church in North America really acknowledges these three creeds as legitimate creeds and statements of faith for the church. The Apostles' Creed, which was already in play by the first century. The Nicene Creed, which came in about the fourth, early fourth century. And then the Athanasius Creed that came in around the fifth century. And the Athanasius Creed is one you may not know as well, but I would encourage you to look it up and read it. It is, it is the creed that really identifies and articulates the idea and understanding of the Trinity. Because the Trinity is a hard concept, right? And almost every attempt that we have to describe the Trinity is actually heresy. Uh, I was talking to one of my professors in the seminary, and we were talking about the Trinity. And he's like, well, how would you guys describe it? I was like, got this. H2O, right? H2O is, is, is water. H2O is steam. H2O is ice. But it's all, and, and he says heresy. I'm like, what? And he explains why, why that, that thinking actually breaks down. And then he, every, everything that any student said, heresy, 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 it's wrong. And I said, okay, professor, how would you describe it to your, he said, how would you describe it to like a five-year-old? I said, how would you describe it to a five-year-old? He goes, oh, I'd use the H2O analogy. <laughs> and he said, it, 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 but it breaks down. It's, at some point, you need to understand there's more to it than that, because there are flaws even in that analogy. The Athanasius Creed really sp explains it so well that the Father is not the Son and the Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. The Spirit is not the Father. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. They are three distinct people, but they are one. There are three persons, one God. And it goes through this over and over again. It states they are one in essence, but they're different. And so it's, it's a mystery. We can't understand it. We can't fully comprehend it because we're human. We're finite trying to understand the infinite. Right, And that's what we have to come to a place in our lives oftentimes is to recognize there's a certain element of our faith that you receive by faith. God is too big for us to fully comprehend. And we understand, so we get to this a holiday like Pentecost, what does that mean for us? And we're going to get into this a little bit and talking about the Holy Spirit and what it does mean for us. But before I get too far into it, let me just explain a couple things about the day of Pentecost. Sometimes we think of that as a New Testament holiday. It is not. Well, it is, but it's not only a New Testament holiday. Fifty days after Passover, after the original Passover, when God leads Israel out of Egypt, 50 days after that is Moses up on Mount Sinai. That's the revelation of God's holiness and the giving of the law, and that's considered the birth of the nation of Israel. That's called Shavuot. On Shavuot, 3,000 people were killed. 50 days after Passover, this revelation of God's holiness, the Ten Commandments, the giving of the law, the birth of the nation of Israel. That's Shavuot. And that is a holiday that was celebrated. 50 days after Passover, Shavuot. That's what's happening in the New Testament. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's sacrificed. 
He is the eternal Passover lamb. No more sacrifices needed. All of that was building to this moment. Now, Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. Forty days after that, Jesus is with his disciples, and he tells them, go and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus is sent. That's, the, that's Ascension Day. That's the day he ascends into heaven. Ten days after that, in the New Testament, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in other words, that's the New Testament word for it. When Shavuot had fully come, that's why they were all there. That's, the, that's 50 days after Passover is the revelation of God's grace and the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And 3,000 people are saved. You see how all this ties together. It's so important. I don't know about you, but for me, when I begin to understand the timing, the symbolism, the significance, the detail that God intentionally used during these feasts and during this time, it, what it does is it helps me realize how much we mean to him and that he's got every detail covered. It gives me hope. It gives me faith. It allows me to trust. You see something I don't see. That's why it's so important to understand these things and why they're so significant to us now because God is sovereign over all things when you read these Old Testament feasts they're pointing us to something Colossians Paul says this to the Colossians let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon Sabbath these are a shadow of the things to come but the substance belongs to Christ that's why we often say the Old Testament is Jesus concealed and the New Testament is Jesus revealed. These things were pointing us. That's what Paul is saying. These are shadows of things that were to come. But the substance, the reality of all this is in Christ. So we get to this holiday, Shavuot, Pas or Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we remember today. And we remember that God had all this covered and he had everything set for a specific time. And there are a lot of different traditions on how churches celebrate Pentecost. Uh, some churches do baptisms all through the day today. In many Pentecost churches, church leaders will wear red vestments. That's why we have the red on the altar down here. Sanctuaries will be decorated uh, depicting ba with banners depicting flames, uh, wind, and doves. One of my favorites is churches in Italy, they, they disperse rose petals from the rafters to symbolize the tongues of fire over people's heads. That's pretty cool. I keep trying to figure out a way we could, we could do that. But leave it to Italy, right? In France, sometimes churches blow trumpets to symbolize the, the sound of the rushing wind as the Holy Spirit filled the place. But regardless of tradition, all agree that we are empowered to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was so that we could be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let me read the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. And this is a continuation of Luke's gospel. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all, now I really had a good joke there, but first service told me not to tell you. Some people are shaking their head even still. See me privately. <laughs> In my first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the word power here that is used in, in the Greek is where we get the word dynamite from. It can be, it, depending on the context, it's sometimes translated dunamis or dynamin. And that's where we get the word dynamite from, this explosive. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we need power. Any of you feel like you need power? I asked this a little while ago. Some of you raise your hands. But I know there are days. There are some days that I feel pretty good. There are other days I don't. 
I know that I need a power that is not from with my, within myself. And the Holy Spirit gives us power, power when we are weak. Acts, or Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. It does not say the Spirit does it for us in our weakness. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. There's a certain aspect of my own responsibility and what I have to do. And, 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 but then when I'm weak, the Holy Spirit is there to help me when I'm weak. And one time, uh, several years ago, I was, I was working out with my oldest son, Gabe. We are working out. And you know how when you work out sometimes, it's good to have a spotter. You guys know what a spotter does when they, when they work out with you? They're, they're watching for just that moment when you can't do it anymore. And then they laugh at you. And then they go, okay, okay, I'll help you. And then they get their hands. And the Holy Spirit doesn't do that, by the way. He doesn't laugh at you. And, but the, the spotter gets their hands under, you know, and they just give it a little bit of lift. They don't do it for you, but just enough so that you can continue to struggle and still get it up, right? So I'm working out with my son Gabe, and we're doing this, and he's making me do more weight than I'm comfortable with doing. And he's like, well, I'm going to try to push you, Dad. I'm like, all right, I don't need it, but I'll do it. And so I'm, I'm doing it, you know, and I get stuck at some point. But he had gotten distracted. He's over off talking to somebody. I'm over here, legs flying in the air, you know, and I'm like trying to, I'm like, ah, I can't really. Finally, he sees, he comes rushing over, and he goes, he helps me up, and he's just laughing so hard. And he, but he helps me up. Well, the Holy Spirit is, like, is a much better spotter than Gabe. <laughs> he helps us in our weakness, right? And that's what Paul is saying. Look, there's times when you're going to need this. You're going to grow, you're going to get stronger, your faith is going gonna, is gonna to advance, but there are going to be times and moments when you're weak, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and he will help you in your weakness. And then he goes on to say in that same passage, he says, we don't know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through an utterance that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Sometimes you just don't know how to pray, so the Holy Spirit that's in you will intercede and lead you in that kind of prayer. It's, this is where we need these spiritual gifts. We need the spiritual gifts in our life. Paul even said to eagerly desire them. Paul said that to the Corinthians. He said, look, this is good. And the Corinthians were kind of enamored with spiritual gifts. And that's why in chapter 13, Paul goes through this whole thing. He's like, look, if you have all those gifts, but you don't have love, you're nothing, right? And then in chapter 14, I don't have this on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Chapter 14, verse 1, he con continues that thought. He says, pursue love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. This is, by the way, how we know that this passage is not referring to another language. Some people have often said, like, the gift of tongues is speaking in another language. If you speak in another language, you speak to men. This says, for he who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. No one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in the tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want all of you to speak in tongues, but even more, that you prophesy. Paul says, I want you to have this. I want you to, to let the Holy Spirit work in your life like this so that you be built up. But when you're together like this, I want you to build each other up. I want you to encourage and edify one another. When you're, when you're proclaiming the word of God, when you're proclaiming what God has spoken, you're building other people up. You're edifying other people. None of this is to draw attention to yourself. It's, it's to draw us closer to God and that we could be his witnesses of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, even in building myself up. Well, should I build myself up? Yes, you should. Jude says it this way. Dear friends, remember that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, what they foretold, they said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will not follow who, who, excuse me, who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who will divide you, who follow mere natural instinct, instincts and do not have the spirit. 
There are people who are going to scoff at what God is doing. People who will scoff at spiritual gifts. People who will scoff at your faith. And they're going to follow their own wisdom, their own ideas, and their own instincts. And they'll divide you. Don't get drawn away by those things. There's something to be learned from that, but you're not to be drawn away by that. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. And keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So Jude here says this is exactly what you need in a world that is drawing people away with worldly wisdom and with natural instincts. Those things, like I said, we live in a natural world, they have their place. But Jude is saying, don't be drawn away by those things. You need to build yourselves up in your most holy faith so that that doesn't happen. So this is an important thing to do. The Holy Spirit helps us when we are weak. The Holy Spirit gives us power to have hope in a hopeless world. And it seems like there's a lot of hopelessness around us right now. When you get into conversations with people for very long, if you talk about politics, if you talk about the economy, if you talk about even religion, if you talk about the church, it gets negative very quick. People are, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of negativity, and it's not coming from bad people, it's coming from hopelessness. It's coming from fear and hopelessness. And the Holy Spirit gives us power to have hope in that situation. Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read this to you. You can read it in the ESV. I'm going to read it to you in the NIV because I like one of the words that the translators use here. But it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word that I like here that doesn't show up in the ESV is the word overflow. The, the ESV says so that you may have, it says that you may abound in hope which is good, but I like the idea, the imagery of overflowing, right? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do you overflow with hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not just gonna happen from watching Fox News or CNN or whatever, you know, you're listening to. <laughs> it's not gonna happen even from just the things we can sort of conjure up, you know, in our own thinking. It says you'll, you'll have power to overflow, not just have a little bit of hope, not just limited hope, because we're not just talking about having hope when everything looks good. It's talking about having hope even when circumstances don't look good. You can have hope regardless of your circumstance. You may be facing a financial difficulty. You may be facing a crisis in your health. You may be facing some sort of difficulty in relationships. There may be things going on in your life that people don't even know behind the scenes you're struggling with, but you can have hope. You can overflow with hope in spite of those things by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're scared about the future, if you're facing uncertain circumstances, you can have hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There have been several times in my life when my circumstances seemed hopeless. Whatever I was facing at that moment, there have been a couple of really key moments that seemed, seemed hopeless. And I can tell you in those times, I was limited in what I could even pray to get myself to a place where I felt hope or I felt that I had faith. And what did it for me was being able to pull away and pray in the Holy Spirit. Being able just to pull away and just to yield and let God work in my life in those moments. Power to have hope. And then all of a sudden, I could begin to see something beyond my circumstance. Even if I didn't understand how the outcome would look, I began to see enough on the horizon that gave me hope. Hope began to rise up. The Holy Spirit will also give us power to speak. You guys ever heard this statement before? Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary? Well, guess what? Sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> Says the person who likes to use words. <laughs> it's true, though. I mean, it is true. And sometimes that statement is given, they give credit to St. Francis of Assisi, although there's no actual proof that he said it, but it is consistent with the types of things that he did say, and it certainly is true. Our life should be like that. My faith, the way that I live, the way that I love, right? It should be a light like that, but at some point, it is necessary. 
to use words. And the Holy Spirit gives us power to speak. We don't have to try to create it. We don't have to try to force it. The Holy Spirit gives us power to speak. There have been key people in my life, and probably uh, the number one person that I saw this working in my life with was my dad, who for years had gone away from the faith. But relationship, we, we had a, a great relationship, and when I would talk to him about faith, even though I hadn't been through seminary, even though I hadn't been in some of these other settings, the Holy Spirit sometimes would just give me the right words. I would drive away from having a conversation with him and be like, where did that come from? That was awesome what I just said. But I knew it wasn't me that said it, right? And, and even he sometimes, he would say something to challenge me and I would give him an answer and he was like, that was pretty good. I was like, I know, right? That was pretty good. But it's the Holy Spirit that does that for us when we don't know what to speak. Acts chapter 2 when the day of Pentecost arrived and they were all in one place, suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then, now in this case, people were hearing them in their own language. When you read through this rest of this passage in chapter two, People are watching this because there's so many people gathered there for Shavuot. They're watching what's happening, and they're like, what's going on? Listen to these guys. They sound like they're drunk. But they were all hearing in their own language, and they didn't understand what was going on. And Peter gets up, and he says, brothers and sisters, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And then he goes on, and he gives this incredible message. Peter who didn't know how to speak. Peter, who put his foot in his mouth so many times, is giving this message, explaining the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and what they were all witnessing right then. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's all of us. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The fulfillment of Shavuot. Who can receive the Holy Spirit then? The answer is anyone. In John chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So what do I do? If this is for anyone, what do I do? A couple of things, because oftentimes it does, even though it is by faith and it's something God does, there's, we're active participants. We, we make a confession of faith. We take a step of faith. What do we do? First thing is this. You gotta remove the barriers. The thing that holds most of us back from really growing in our spiritual life is our minds. And that's the biggest barrier is our own thinking. Paul says this, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. In other words, you cannot comprehend all of this. Your mind is, if we're constantly trying to understand every single thing, we will be limited because these are finite minds trying to understand the infinite. An illustration that I like to use oftentimes is that of uh, an ant farm. If you ever seen an ant farm? You know, it's got little ants crawling around and, you know, they're, they're digging little trails and if you're cool, you thump it. And, you know, the trail collapses and they have to start over again. I haven't done that, but I've heard that people do that. 
And this little ant in here, he's so consumed with the very thing he's doing right in front of him. Digs, he has no idea, this ant, that there's air conditioning out here. There's a sound man back there turning microphones on and off. There's, there's airplanes flying over right now, taking people all over the world. This little ant has no idea that this entire thing exists, yet it does. And we're the ant. And we're living in our little ant hill. And we're trying to understand something that is called holy. And in fact, in the, in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, when, when, they, when they call God holy, it's not just that he's righteous and just. It's he's completely other, worldly. He is holy. He is other. We're trying to comprehend something that our minds cannot fully comprehend. Now, God's given us a revelation of himself in the scripture. He's given us sufficient revelation that we understand what it means to be in relationship with him. But there are certain things that we will never fully comprehend in this world. And our minds have to get out of the way. It's by the spirit that it is discerned. Years ago, we were on a little family vacation down to Siesta Key with another family, the McCraney. Some of you guys know Mike and her name McCraney. And we're down there. And Mike and I, you know, we were having such a great time with our family, but we need some coffee. And uh, thank God for coffee. You know, it's biblical, Hebrews, and holy grounds. And I can go on. I can make it very biblical. And so we're, um, we're driving to go get coffee, and we're having this conversation about God, and it's kind of stirring each other up and thinking about, we were just thinking about the bigness and awesomeness of God and the goodness and the grace of God, and we were kind of overwhelmed by that. By now I'm driving, and I've got this raspberry mocha I'd never had before. I only drink black coffee usually, but I'm having this raspberry mocha, and I'm like, this is, this is probably why I remember the story. The raspberry mocha was so good. Like when I tasted it, I was like, I was about to get saved again or something. I don't know. It was like I was having a religious experience. And, and Mike said to me, he said, if we can fit God in our minds, we put him in a box. Yes, we need to study. Yes, we need to understand as much as we can. Yes, we need to grow. But we also need to understand that we can't put God in a box, that we can't make him fit into our understanding. There's a mystery to some of it. Some of it can only be discerned by the Holy Spirit. We have to get that barrier of our own thinking out of the way. The second thing we can do is to actually request the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's what Jesus said. Request it. Now remember, God is one. We're not talking about three separate gods. God is one. But there is distinction between how they work as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our lives. I need the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in my life. And so he says, request the Holy Spirit. And God will give it to you. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, as I read earlier, eagerly desire these things, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Walk in love. Don't desire the spiritual gifts to draw attention to yourself. Don't desire, you know, to grow in your faith and all these things to show off in some way. It's not for that purpose. Don't desire the Holy Spirit in your life so that you can look spiritual. Spiritual arrogance is the worst kind of arrogance to me. We should be humble. The purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit is so that I may be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Request the gift. I want to be as close to God as humanly possible. This has been my prayer since I was a teenager. When I began to really embrace my faith as my own, I was thinking, okay, if God is real... And God is knowable. What is more important than that? If, if heaven is real and God is real and he's made a way for me to know him and let him work, what could be more important than that? The answer to me was nothing. There are other things that are important, yes, but they don't reach that level of importance as the primary focus of my life. There are important things that we all do, important things that happen in our lives, important relationships, important conversations, things that are good for us to enjoy and to enjoy the life that God has given us. But for me, I I, I thought, 
God, I want to be as close to you as humanly possible while I'm on this earth. Along the way, I have screwed up a lot. And in my pursuit of knowing him, I make mistakes. But that's where the Holy Spirit works in our lives, to lead us through that, to teach us, to cultivate us, to disciple us. I need the Holy Spirit in my life so that I can be as close to God as I can and so that I can allow him to work through my life to be a light and witness to others. And the final thing is this, to receive it by faith. It's just by faith. So many times we want to formulize it. We want to structure it in such a way so that we're in control. And this happens a lot in Christianity. We try to get the formula right. If you pray this prayer right, if you mix your faith in with this and you get this and this and smoke's coming out, you look like some kind of mad faith scientist. And you got to get it just right so that you can get the outcome you want. And it's not like that. And it's just by faith. It's by faith. You can't figure it all out. You can't turn it into a formula. I mean, you could try, but you'll be frustrated. Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it is actually impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Even the way that we're in relationship with God is by faith. So everything that happens is by faith. Paul said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. When people are drawn to faith because of a leader, that is dangerous. Because all of us, every leader, every person is flawed and could fail. And that's why Paul's like, I'm not trying to draw you with human wisdom and draw it. It's, it's by faith, right? It's by the demonstration of the Spirit's power because your faith needs to be in God, not in any human. I don't want to draw you by human wisdom or persuasive words. But somebody else could come along with more persuasive words. But it's by the demonstration of the Spirit's power that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, that we receive this by faith. Now, I'm not sure where you are in your faith journey today, but I, won't, I would love all of us to have a fresh, you know, we always talk about that spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. You guys know that old famous song? That we just have a fresh encounter, a fresh experience, a fresh outpouring of God's spirit in our life, a fresh yielding by faith to the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Allow God to work through us so that I can be as close to him as humanly possible and so that it could be seen in my life by those around me, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Amen? Would you stand with me? And we're going to come at just a moment and receive communion together. But I really want to encourage you, as I'm getting ready to lead us in a prayer of confession and a prayer of surrender, I want you to take a moment, though, in your own heart and maybe just ask God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life for the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you get out of your own way, to help you get out of your own mind so that you don't limit what God is doing in your life. That leap of faith, that step of faith. And a leap of faith is, uh, is for me like uh, Indiana Jones, <laughs> like how it's like a solemn moment right into a Steven Spielberg moment, movie. Uh, Indiana Jones, you know, he's standing there on that thing, and he has to take that step, you know, that famous scene, and he can't see that the thing is there, but he has to, he just kind of like, <sighs> takes that step, so great, and then he lands on it, and you're like, oh, well, that's what it is like sometimes, it's like, you can't see what God has right in front of you, you just got to take that step of faith, and sometimes just yielding to him, because we, we want to be in control, yielding to his sovereignty, yielding to him as Lord is is a leap of faith like that. And maybe you need to make that leap of faith today. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I just want to encourage you to pray with me, but you mean it in faith. You pray it in your heart. Maybe for the first time, or maybe for you, it's just a, a fresh renewal of your commitment and a surrender to the Holy Spirit in your life. Would you pray with me? Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord together. I'll lead you, but you repeat after me, but you make it your prayer. And then Pastor Dave is going to come and lead us in communion. Let's pray this together. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. 
have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you to be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.